He has published uh, over 180 papers, and he has uh, co-released 33 wheat and five barley and four triticale cultivars. Dr. Steve will be talking today uh, about the challenges of plant breeding, history, and current status, uh, genomic selection. With that, please welcome Dr. Steve Benziger. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the organizers. I would like to thank the sponsors. And our department head, Rock Kaswan, couldn't be with us. He's doing faculty evaluations. But he wanted to also thank the graduate students and say what an honor it is to partner with Pioneer on a symposium like this. Uh, Ibrahim's given my title. And I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, of which Ibrahim is one, as is Aaron Lorenz. They're the brains behind this, basically. And so we'll let them take the questions. No, teasing. OK, so now let's see. OK, now, just want to start with a personal bias, which is that genomic selection is the way I want to breed when I retire. I'll be 61 this month, so I don't have a lot of time. But this is the way I'm hoping to finish out my career. And it will work for any complex trait. And we're going to show you the complex traits that I work with, uh, such as stem rust resistance, grain yield, I still believe that there'll be room for hybrid wheat, so I'm interested in heterosis and all the other traits. Now, I always view a symposium as this as somewhat of a celebration of plant breeding. And I always like to give you an idea of what a relatively small, nothing like the pioneers of the world, breeding program at a public institution can do. So in 2010, uh, Nebraska produced about 3.8 billion pounds of wheat, and it was valued at about half a billion dollars. Okay? Um, the increase due to genetics was about 20 percent, so that that meant that uh, about a hundred, little 110 million dollars each year to the farmers of Nebraska were due to research done in the public sector, or done by breeders, is what I should say. And at that time, the Nebraska market share was 66 percent. That's about normal. So that the program itself added $71 million at the farm gate to growers in Nebraska. That doesn't include our varieties being grown in Colorado, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, and the like. And uh, we like people making money. Farming should be a profitable business. And uh, they pay our taxes, which support our universities. But at the same time, that's not why I got into plant breeding. I got into plant breeding for this reason. That same roughly 4 billion pound crop feeds about uh, 20 million people. That's roughly 10 times the population of Nebraska. Gives them their annual consumption of wheat. Uh, the amount due to genetics is 20%, so we're a little bit over 4, billion, 4 million people get fed their wheat by what plant breeders do, public and private. And the program itself because we have a 66% market share, the program itself feeds about 2.7 million people. And I always like to bring that up because we're in a serious business. And we can talk great about the theory and the reasons and all the types of things we do. And I thought Joe gave a beautiful example of why it's so important. And it's because fundamentally, I sleep well at night knowing that 2.7 million people are getting their nutrition because of work that that myself and all the people in the state work on wheat. And that's still more than the population of Nebraska, just due to genetics. Fundamentally at the heart, all plant breeders are scientists. And I always love this quote. We shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So if you think about plant breeders, yes, we make products. But at the same time, we also create new science. And that new science is very important because that cr then creates the future varieties. When you look at Joe's talk, and he talked about doubling the rate of gain, that's unheard of. I mean, and there's, uh, with the exception of a very few years in the very beginning of the Green Revolution, have you seen that? Never since. So doubling the rate of grain is a massive challenge for a world that has massive challenges in it. Now, the topics I'm going to go through will be a very brief history of scientific plant breeding. I want to explain that it's an integrative science involving statistics, genetics, and the environment. And then talk a little bit about where I think plant breeding is going in the future. 
and hopefully in some ways lay an introduction for all the very elegant and very smart speakers that will follow after me. Now the history of plant breeding begins with simply domestication. You think about it, your crops were weeds at one time, and that was done millennia ago through very careful selection. Then it became a practice where you knew that you needed good selection and keen observation. Then they added statistical differences. Then relatively recently, they added genetics. Then quantitative genetic theory. And then extensive phenotyping. And that was where I think the first sort of term, it's a numbers game, came out. Then they added high throughput genotyping, and everybody thought that would be so expensive we wouldn't get to use it. And as Joe said, that's actually the cheapest part now of our costs. Then they added high throughput phenotyping, which is what most of us are working on now, trying to get that precision that Joe talked about. And in the future, I think what you're going to look at is modeling, prediction, and simulation. Because even though you see the hundreds or thousands of testing sites that Pioneer has and, and the testing sites we have, we have 100 environments before we release a cultivar. It's not enough. So we've gone to the next generation genotyping. We're now working on the next generation phenotyping. And in the future, it'll be the next generation modeling and simulation. Now, Joe made a, a very good comment about the uh, plant breeding uh, was, is, was originally the nexus of uh, genetics and statistics and that everything relates to the phenotype. And the phenotype was usually described as a function of the genotype, the environment, and the interaction, the genotype by environment interaction. That's been modified in that the environment is now split out into two components. One you can control, that's the management system, and one that you can't, that's sort of the weather. Okay? So that G, or the phenotype equals the genotype plus the environment plus the genotype by environment interaction has become the genotype plus the management system, plus the environment, okay, plus the interactions of the genotype with the management system, with the environment, and the management via environmental interaction. And that's important because what it explains is when you talk about your best phenotyping and your best farming practices, you do control those farming practices. It makes a big difference if you're planting a crop in an untilled field, a tilled field makes a big difference if you're adding herbicides or pesticides. It makes a big difference if you're adding irrigation. And so as a breeder, we have to think about how the environment relates to what we do. We need to know what we can control. We need to know what we can't control. Efficiency is usually measured in a gain per cycle, but frankly, it's basically going to be measured in gain per year. And we like people that have winter nurseries when you grow winter wheat, and that's not a possibility. And that gets into the questions, how are we going to respond to the changes that we need in the future, and how do we cope with the prospect of change? Now, all this says is that you have the genotype on one side, you have the phenotype on the other side, and the fulcrum is the environment. And you really have to understand that. Now, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Nebraska, and for those of you that are unfamiliar, especially those on the webinar, you have to understand that Nebraska is a fulcrum or a foci of environmental diversity. There's as much diversity between Omaha on eastern Nebraska and Scotts Bluff on western Nebraska as there is between Omaha and Washington, D.C. Okay? So everything we do, we live and die by the G by E and by the environment. Okay? And this is an evapotranspiration map, and if you look at it, I'm not sure I can work this pointer well. But anyway, this would be basically a corn-soybean area that transitions into a wheat fallow corn area, formerly sorghum, transitioning into a wheat fallow wheat area, transitioning into a grasslands only, all due to moisture. Okay? So those are the three main ecosystems of Nebraska, and that's what we have to breed for. Okay? So if you like working with the environment, this is a great place to be. Now, if you go into the history of molecular markers, initially we started out with marker-assisted selection, and then we evolved into marker-assisted breeding. And then the, the purpose of this symposium is that you're going to talk about uh, genome-wide selection. And I want to give you a little bit of a background on how we got there. And the role of markers in crop improvement, and this is from Aaron's slide, and it just shows you the different types of things you can look at. The, 
purpose of the QTL mapping, how you use germplasm, the number of loci, what you want to do, and this uh, becomes critical. And you can see that if you want to work with selection, you want to predict performance, and you want to do it in elite germplasm, you're going to be working with genome-wide selection. But it took us a while to get there. You know, we learned as we went along in these processes. So instead of phenotyping for genetic value, we want to genotype for genetic value. And again, the reason for that is time and cost. So what do you need? You want to perform your selection in the off-season. Now, Joe's got three seasons a year. As a winter wheat breeder, I get one. So you can see I have a different view of time than Joe would have, OK? You want to increase your selection accuracy. And I want to show you in a very practical way how that will actually occur. And you want to increase your selection intensity. You want no plot in your field that you could throw out. You know, if you, if you could predict that it's not going to succeed, you want it out there. You don't have to test it. And if you look at marker-assisted selection, we have some great opportunities. Again, Joe mentioned the Erie website. The sub-1 gene, during the monsoonal rains, there's massive flooding, and rice will drown if it's underwater. Okay. And the difference between where you see the, the flooded patties with virtually no plants and the full stands, that's a single gene. Marker-assisted selection was remarkable. Same thing's working with UG99, stem rust race. It's one of the biblical plagues of Egypt. That's being done by genes, carotenoids, and corn. So we do have very good examples already deployed of marker-assisted selection. Now, Let's talk a little bit about the history. And I want to give it from a perspective. Most people here will probably talk about corn or other crops. We're going to give it from a wheat perspective, just to sort of broaden your view. Uh, in the 1980s, we were very interested in looking at how we're going to change our breeding system. And when we started, there were virtually no molecular markers in wheat. There were very few polymorphic ones. Those that were polymorphic were mainly between wild species and cultivars. That's not where breeders usually like to work. Okay? There were extremely good cytogenetic socks. We had a scientist here, a cytogeneticist, who had developed a very unique set of material, reciprocal chromosome substitution lines, where she substituted one chromosome from one variety for a chromosome in another variety. And she did it for the whole genome in wheat. Now, wheat has 42 chromosomes, 21 chromosome pairs. So she did this 21 different times. And then she did it reciprocally. She took the other cultivar and substituted the chromosome into that one 21 times. And she did it in duplicate because we didn't have molecular markers, so she had to see if there was any background variation. And the two lines she chose were Cheyenne. Cheyenne happens to be the founding parent of all the Nebraska germplasm. And Wichita, which at the time she started, was a very popular Kansas variety. And if you look at the coefficient of parentage, Cheyenne is still extremely um, closely related to cultivars. In the 1980s, Siouxland was one of our most popular, and Brule was our most popular cultivar. So a remarkable stroke. This is what she found. Now, I'm going to explain this slide, give you an idea what it means. Okay? What you're seeing here on this is the deviation in grain yield by chromosome. Okay? Now, this is the effect of Wichita chromosomes substituted into Cheyenne. So if you look at this one, this is Wichita chromosome 1A replacing Cheyenne chromosome 1A, where the whole rest of the genome would be Cheyenne. So you've basically taken the, the genome of Cheyenne, or of wheat, and partitioned it into roughly 5% increments. And what she saw was, or what we saw, and this was done by Terry Berkey, one of my former students, so chromosome 3A increased yield by about 15%. Chromosome 6A increased yield by about 12, 13%. Chromosome 3B, when you put Wichita into Cheyenne, drastically reduced yield by about 25%. The idea we were trying to get at is, do major genes exist? Or are they all minor genes? Now, from this, you can't really tell, because you could be really lucky and have one chromosome that just had 10 really small genes on it. But aggregately, that chromosome was very important.
But for the first time, because we had no molecular markers, we were able to say, yes, we could identify chromosomes that made a massive difference on grain yield. Okay? Now, I told you Rosalind did this in reciprocal. These happen to be the Cheyenne chromosomes now substituted into Wichita. So when you put Cheyenne 3A into Wichita, you decrease yield by about 17%. When you put 6A into uh, Wichita, it decreases yield by close to 20%. And 3B has no effect whatsoever. If you look at the summation, what you see is that 3A, when you put Wichita into Cheyenne, it increases it by the 16, 15%. Put the Cheyenne into Wichita, decreases it by 15%, a mere image. That sounds like a chromosome you'd want to pursue, doesn't it, if you're looking at yield. 6A has a very similar effect. 3B has a unilateral effect. What actually happened on 3B is that the winter hardiness gene in Cheyenne is on 3B. The winter hardiness genes in Wichita are not on 3B. You put Wichita into Cheyenne, Cheyenne winter kills. You put the winter hardiness of Cheyenne into Wichita, it's already winter hardy, it has no effect. So that explains the unilateral effect of 3B. Now, of course, yield is a complex trait. So we then looked at all the components of yield. What you see is that the Cheyenne chromosome, substituting the Wichita for Cheyenne, 3A and 6A, which are in red, increases grain yield. It also increases kernel weight, which means that most likely the yield is due to larger kernels. Grain volume weight's minor. Plant height, it made it shorter, but it also made it earlier. So the first thing we were worried about is, oh my god, we got an earliness gene and tough. I mean, it affects yield. You look at grain yield in Wichita, the Cheyenne chromosome decreases at 3A and 6A. It does it by changing its tilling plant pattern. So you've changed the developmental structure. But no effect on anthesis state. So it's not due to just earliness. Okay, there's something more there. That was huge. Now, I don't know if Michael's here, but this is from Todd Campbell's work. I know Michael works with Todd. And what we then did is we did what you should do, is we made the biparental cross, except we did it in the substitution backgrounds, so that we now have about 100 lines which differ only in the segments of chromosome 3A. So it's much more powerful than a recombinant inbred line population. This is, in fact, a recombinant inbred chromosome line population. What you see here is there's a very sharp band, the blue, which is the combined analysis. Here you see, and then, and then we have each of the environments. So this is one environment, this is another environment, this is another environment. So in three out of the six environments we tested it at, we had very significant QTL effects. This is the fourth environment. Now is that a QTL or not? Statistically, it's not. Okay, But is it a QTL? You bet it is. And when you think about genomic selection, which we're going to come back to, where you don't get bogged down with statistics, that one would count. But you also see there's two environments where it's not expressed at all. That looks a little bit like G by E, doesn't it? That's what it is. Now, this trait is really wonderful because it never hurts you. This is a classic G by E due to changes in magnitude. So even at the lowest yielding environments, the Wichita allele was better than the Cheyenne allele, but it becomes significantly better in the higher yielding environments. So it never hurts you, and it can help you. Well, we kind of thought, you know, seeing as Cheyenne was released in 1933 and Wichita in 1954, and we've got 60 years of plant breeding since then, and you have something that affects 15% of your yield, maybe the breeders should have incorporated it. So we took a whole series of cultivars released from 1950 on up and said, what's happening at the locus that we think is important? What we found was there's still a lot of lines that have Cheyenne's allele, which was perplexing. 
most of our modern new cultivars, and certainly our higher yielding cultivars, have the Wichita allele. And as you would expect in plant breeding, there's many other lines that have a completely different allele, which says we're not a closed population. We're bringing in new germplasm all the time. And so we don't have the Cheyenne or the Wichita allele. And that becomes important when you get back to thinking about some things. Now, what was interesting was, it looks like, with one exception, the cultivars that have the Cheyenne allele are adapted to this area. The cultivars that have the Wichita allele are adapted to this area. So it appears that where you are selecting for higher yield and higher performance, breeders were, su were successful. Where you didn't need the allele, it was neutral. And the selection didn't matter. And where would those regions be? This is where the allele's not important. This is where the allele is important, unless you're growing it under irrigation in those environments. Now, so we knew that we had alleles. We knew they were a major effect. And we decided, how can we improve our system? So we started, and this is Ibrahim's work, on marker-assisted breeding. Okay? The process is you genotype your lines, then you phenotype your lines, you determine the estimated breeding values, then you select the lines with the best estimated breeding values. And the rationale is that, A, we didn't have a training population, which is what you need for good genomic selection, and B, our populations change every year. So you cannot predict the estimated breeding value necessarily from one year to the next unless you've got a good training population. Needless to say, we're working on getting a good training population, but we're not there yet. Okay? Very quick, very free-flowing, and it depends upon how good your algorithm is. So one of the things we asked is, how diverse is our germplasm? So this we used, yeah, it's okay. You can't read the small print at the bottom and the back. We understand. We, this is a concept slide, okay? And the concept is that the two parents we use in our F6 nursery, Camelot's about here, Good Streak's about here, and we have a tremendous amount of diversity beyond the two checks, which simply tells me that I've got more diversity than what I use within the program that I've released. I needed some kind of anchor. But it also showed me that I have three main populations based on the molecular markers. Now, we had to use darts on this. We're going to switch to GBS uh, if it works for us. But darts, at the time, were the cheapest, most effective marker. These are what the three different clusters look like. This is two-dimensional, so you flatten them out. I think if you could look at it three-dimensional, you would see that the overlap here is probably only because we've made it 2D as opposed to having the clusters pulled out on a three-dimensional space. Okay? But I wanted to know, how did I select? And what you see here, here are your clusters, the blue, the black, and the red. The green dots are what were selected for advancement. So my question was, how quickly did I narrow the germplasm back down again? And the answer is lines from all three of those clusters got advanced to the next generation. We now have another year's data, and lines from those same three clusters all got advanced to the next generation. So the point is, is I'm maintaining within my breeding program the level of diversity that I would hope to take what nature's going to give. You know, I don't, I'm very worried about becoming too narrow. Okay? Now, why genomic selection or genome-wide selection? OK. In closed populations, you can build your breeding values very well. OK? As genotyping becomes less expensive, and right now you should figure with GBS, genotype by sequencing, it costs me $20 a line. I'm sure for companies, they probably got a better system. I hope. <laughs> anyway, $20 a line to phenotype is $35 a plot. That's the difference, OK? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out if you can genotype. That's the cheaper of the two, OK? And that's what becomes important. And we're thinking of genotyping all of them, and then hopefully estimating them, and then deciding what we want to plant. That's our goal. And this is slides from Aaron. And it gets the concept of complex traits, because you throw away the statistical need. You just have to say, is it positive or negative? Okay? So for some traits, like fat percentage, it's simple. But for complex traits, like yield, and you saw that that was only one chromosome I showed you, it's much more complex when you're working with all 21. 
you don't have to worry about the statistical value. You just pick whether or not it's important or not. And of course, the sequencing is becoming so cheap, like I said. Now this is in corn, and this is a, a slide I Aaron got from Buckler's lab, and, and you can see you know, basically how the cost has just dropped off. Almost a, unbelievable. And it's going to get cheaper. Okay, what am I done around there? Okay. So what is genomic selection? And, and again, I apologize because you're going to hear it much better from the other speakers. It comprises methods that use genotypic data across the whole genome to predict complex traits with an accuracy sufficient to allow selection on the prediction value alone. And so the idea is, is that you, you're going to make your crosses, you're going to genotype the candidates, you're going to use your genomic selection, and you're going to advance those lines with the highest estimated breeding values, and then you move them into your varietal testing program. Okay? What are the essentials? You need genome-wide selection. You need a form of marker-based selection. Avoid QTL mapping. Just pick the markers which are useful. Uh, it's made possible by high-throughput marker technologies, relatively new statistics, high-performance computing. This, you know, I just spent $40,000 for a new GPS planter and another $40,000 to get the tractor to make it work the way I want to make it work. And I'm thinking my computer will probably cost as much <laughs> when I get all done with it. Um, the advantage over traditional marker, you have very high marker-based selection, very high marker density, allows excellent marker linkage phases, uh, captures all small effects, and no or arbitrary statistical threshold. That fourth location that was clearly at the right site for the QTL, it counts in genomic selection. If I didn't have the other three sites, that one may not have counted. Okay? A lot of advantages. And this again gets back to where do you pick your marker if you have to have a statistical threshold level. And then the cycle again. Now, what's interesting is what this really shows you to me is the difference between marker-assisted breeding and genome-wide selection is this part, the training module. Okay, You can do this on marker-assisted breeding, basically doing it on the fly, using the data that you have, other than I can't predict beforehand which lines I will plant. I can only predict which ones I would advance. But with the training module, you can actually do this in advance. Okay, So it becomes extremely valuable for people that have massive genotyping capabilities and good phenotyping capabilities. This is certainly the way we want to go. Now, okay, that's nice. Now let's apply it. Let's put it into a standard breeding program, and we're going to use mine as an example. Okay, there are three phases to any breeding program. The first one is when you introduce variation, usually done by a cross. The second phase is once you've got all that variation in an F1, you need to partition it out. That's usually done in self-pollinated crops by inbreeding and then selecting as you inbreed. Okay? And then once you have all of that good segregation and selection occurring, then you go to the evaluation phase. It takes us roughly 12 years. Okay? One to two years to make the crosses three to six to do the evaluation. That's, that's year three to six to do the selection and segregation. Evaluation is usually year seven to year 12. So this is how we do it. We make our crosses. Normally we make 700 to 900. We got a little exuberant. We're over 1,000 this year. This, this is where we are in the greenhouse making our crosses. In the future, we're going to add transgenes, more wide hybrids, and more mutation work probably. So that's other sources of variation. Don't think a cross is the only way you can do it. In the segregation and selection, we're going to use better assays, genomic selection, doubled haploidy where appropriate. We don't have the resources that some people have to, to do massive doubled haploidy, and Pioneer is one of the truly examples of great double haploid uses. Okay. But first of all, you've got to figure out what are you selecting for? And that becomes important. In our case, we have four traits. We try to keep it simple. Number one, it's got to survive the winter. It's perfectly OK for a line to die in my field. It's totally unacceptable if it dies in a farmer's field. Okay. We are where stem rust, which is a temperature-dependent disease, and temperature and moisture coincide. So that's our major disease. It can be devastating when it occurs. So everything we release must have stem rust resistance. Okay. 
this is the original marker technology. You spray your plant with red paint and you harvest what you've sprayed. Okay? That's the marker technology. It has to have good agronomics. It should be standing in the field, you know, it should be flowering at the right time, those kinds of things, okay? Yeah, it's been a long time. I've come a long way, you know, these little things you can't see, okay? And the last but not least, in wheat, you've got to make a loaf of bread, okay? So you have to have quality. Those are the four key things. Everything else is nice. These are critical, okay? So in year two, we grow the F1 crosses in the greenhouse or Yuma, Arizona, depending upon what our uses are. They're also the F3, or the, the F1 crosses are grown in the greenhouse or field. The F2 bulks are then grown at Mead. That's our main winter killing site. We want to get rid of the riffraff pretty quickly. Okay. We also infect them with stem rust. Don't always get a good take, but we're trying to get rid of the disease susceptibles and the winter tender material very quickly. Okay. Year four, we grow the F3 bulks at Mead again. Another chance for a winter. This year we had no winter kill. Next year we're hoping we will. Okay. We duplicate that in Sydney because you have hail, things like that destroy your nurseries. We then go in and we snap heads to make our head rows. We usually take 45,000 head rows every year. This is the harvest. We do a lot of hand labor. And then in year six we grow about 1,800 to 2,000 observation plots. Okay. We harvest 450 of those, run them through our quality laboratory, make sure they're within the parameters of good quality, and on the basis of that, take 280 to the next generation. Okay? This is how we do it. We do it with the mixograph. Very simple, 10 grams. Uh, you mill 50 and you get 10 grams of flour, and you can test whether or not it's good or bad. If you want, this is what we're looking for, that kind of curve with a good protein level. Okay, year seven, we grow those 280 lines plus two checks replicated 10 times each for 300 plots at up to nine locations. This time we had seven. Last year we harvested six. Previous year it was nine. We harvest all the seed with a combine, and on the basis of the agronomic performance, then we do the milling and baking full test. Okay, now if you look at this, where's the weakest link? Okay. First weakest link is the year six when we're growing 1,800 to 2,000 lines that are visually evaluated in one location in a semi poorly augmented replicated design. Okay. How many environments do we test in? How many ecogeographic regions do we have? Three ecogeographic regions, and we're growing them only in one. That's all the seed we have. That's a problem. Okay. Where's the second problem? Year seven. When we have the 280 lines plus the two checks, they're grown at the seven environments, okay? But they're unreplicated, okay? And this gets into a point that jean Luca may, if he has time, talk about replicated alleles versus replicated plots. I personally like replicated plots. I get much better estimates, and we have a tremendous biometry group here to help us with those things. But the point is, if I can't get replicated plots, if I can get replicated values for the alleles, because these alleles are in the 280 lines, are in the 1800 lines, then I get a much better estimate of what that allele is worth, and therefore I can get a much better estimate of what the line is worth. Now the other part, and this is where if you had a good training population, okay, I think I could do the markers on my 2,000 lines, and I could say very quickly, whoa, this line's going to be great in eastern Nebraska. This line's going to be much better in western Nebraska, something which I have no way of telling right now. And in the future, you'd say, man, this isn't going to be good anywhere in Nebraska, but it fits South Dakota or North Dakota extremely well. So I think the targeting ability of genomic selection, once you have good estimates of your training population, becomes huge as you actually put it into your program. Now, once we get past the F6, F7s here, and again, these are our environments. Remember, this is my main testing sites. This is Lincoln, and I'm trying to breed wheats for over here because this is one-third of the wheat acreage. I could sure use some marker help to tell me which, which does better there. Okay? The way you get around that is you have relaxed selection standards and hope that you got stuff that does well over there. Now, 
replications. I like replicated designs. I don't like the perfect fields Joe talks about because those perfect fields, they grow corn on and they don't grow wheat. Okay, that's what happens. The worst corn ground in Nebraska is probably better than the best wheat ground in Nebraska. Okay, that's just the way it works. Okay, there's an economic incentive to grow corn and a you know, wonderful technology they've done. So the fields I get are like this. That's drought. Okay, that's not too surprising. Okay. Most of you, because you work with summer annuals, never have a concept of what a winter does. Well, do you think that maybe having a snow band going right across your plots might change a little spatial variation in your field? It gives you the concept that it's insulated against the brunt of the winter. It's got a little more moisture in the spring. It's got a whole ton of things. That's what I work with. Okay. So the concept of replicated alleles over replicated plots even with all the spatial variation I can take out when I have replicated plots, becomes extremely useful. Okay. Now, after that, then we go into replicated trials. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We have replicated trials at all of the locations. We have uh, good milling and baking. By the way, that's a, that's a commercial flower. That's one of our experimental lines. That's one that we use for making bricks, and we hope never graces the door of our quality laboratory again. Okay, We have those. And we continue on. And that's, that's year eight. When you get up to year nine, then we look at our cropping systems, our biometry, and our modeling. And that's, again, we just repeat the process. And the whole point is that the summary is that blinds with good end use quality, good performance are advanced. On average, we look at over 100,000 lines before we get a variety. That's small by probably pioneer scandal, uh, standards. We harvest over 15,000 plots before we'll find a variety. We do good, the good data on the good performing lines are based on evaluations at well over 100 location years worth of data because we don't have consistent environments. You know, Joe talks about how the year kills it. In our case, both the year and where we are in the gradient of environments in Nebraska will kill a line. Okay. And surprises happen. This winter is a surprise. The second line I released, it was 70 degrees in Hayes, Kansas on January 31st. On February 1st, it was 32 degrees for the high. On February 2nd, it was zero. The second line I released broke dormancy. Its growing point was above the soil. When it hits zero degree for the high, you can imagine that line completely winter killed. 13 years in the development, and that was a surprise. Okay, I've had other nurseries where I've lost every early line I had in it because of five previous years, there was no winter killing of significance. I mean, there was average winter killing, and then we got a harsh year. What you need to think about is what does that do to your training module? Okay, Training models are all based on averages. So you will see a breeder like myself, we're interested in the training module, we're interested in how that tells us things, but we still are going to rely on the phenotypic evaluation because any training module model that I can build, I can't have surprises built into the averages very well. Okay. And again, the other thing you have to think about is why do we use marker-assisted selection or marker-assisted breeding as opposed to full genomic-wide selection? We're constantly getting new alleles. Our program is based on open populations, very diverse, for which we don't know the allelic values. So we have to have a mix. Anything I know the value on, boy, genomic selection. Anything that I'm not sure of, that'll probably be marker-assisted breeding. What method do you use? The one that fits your objective. We would use marker-assisted uh, selection for back crossing. We would use marker-assisted breeding for new germplasm. And for your mainstay core breeding program, your intermating in amongst your, your main lines you already have well characterized, use genomic selection. And remember, the marker doesn't matter. We've gone from darts to SNPs to 9K SNPs. We're hoping to go to genotype by sequencing. And who knows where we'll be at next time, probably sequencing the whole, whole genome, which for wheat is pretty hard to do. Now, I'm going to end on a couple of slides. Two things. For those of you that want to be plant breeders, there's three joys of plant breeding. Okay? The first one is when you make the cross. 
That's because all the creativity of what's going to come out of that cross is that. That's like mixing your colors on a painting. Okay. The second is when you go out and you see a line and you know it's got everything that takes to make it a cultivar. Okay. You'll remember where you were in the field. You will remember whether the sun was shining, whether the wind was blowing. You will remember everything about it. And the last part is when that line is grown on millions of acres. Okay. And you remember when you held every seed of that line in the palm of your hand. That's what a head row is. There's enough seed to hold it in the palm of your hand when you have that head row. Okay? So never forget what is in the palm of your hand, what was within your grasp when you're entering the field of plant breeding. The last one is this. By the way, this is how you make money raising wheat in Nebraska. Okay? <laughs> It, it takes out the high and low cycles of the crop, okay? This is in western Nebraska. We like this, okay? But the point is, a good past is positively dangerous if it makes us content with the present and unprepared for the future. We have a great track record on phenotypic selection, but it's not going to lead us to where we need to be. If you listen to Joe's talk about a massive world great company and how it's evolving, it's because a great good past is dangerous if it makes us content with the present and unprepared for the future. That's what our goals are. With that, I'll stop and I think there may be time for a question or two. Okay, so the, let me repeat the question. The question is when you do more genomic selection, will that lead to less diversity? And will uh, what is UNL, our program, doing to make sure that we're maintaining it? The slide that we showed where we showed our three clusters, what I would do now is I would cluster the data, and then I would say, you know, usually the top 30 lines out of the 57 are obvious. They're really, you know, they're pretty much stars. The next 27, you kind of look at and you think, well, should I keep them or should I not? And you have trade-offs. You know, this one's a little lower on test weight. This one's a little later. This one's a little earlier. I would now go into the clusters and make sure that those clusters are well sampled. So you know, you'd look at your first 30 lines, the stars, the ones that you know you're going to take, and you say, do they fit? And you may find all of them in one cluster. You'd say, OK, wait a minute. That's too narrow. Now let me go look at the next 27, the ones that are sort of the on the bubble wheats. Let me make sure I've kept those. Okay, So that's how I would approach that. And in fact, what's interesting is we didn't have a way of doing that before. You know, if you think about it, the only way we did it before was by pedigree. We would say, okay, wait a minute. I got 10, 10 really good lines out of this cross. Do I take all 10 or do I take their best five and substitute for five others? Now I can look at the molecular diversity. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, how do we integrate all of our genomic tools with the modeling tools we expect to have in the future with what we're already doing? In the way I approach that is I, I get really bright graduate students. And, and, and they tell me. <laughs> no, I mean, I, mean, I mean, that's being somewhat facetious. But, but that's the point, is, is that what you're going to have to do is we're going to change the way we approach things. You know, if I look at this program, what I may do this year, just to give you an example of how easy it is to change, we now have modern combines. We may not visually select in our observation nursery. We may cut all 2,000 plots just because we don't think the eye is capable. I mean, we can get rid of the ones that are lodged and things like that. So we'll probably have this blend. And the quickest, the question we have is, can you do it in time? You know, if, if I took 
2,000 plots. I have to get them DNA'd, you know, genotyped, get the data back, analyzed, and then correct it before I go to the next nursery. And I can do some of that, but if I wanted to then buttress with the phenotype, I'm harvesting up till August and I'm planting in September. That's a different question that people have. So you're going to just do the best you can. You know, plant breeders are always sort of doing the best we can. I mean, that's, that's it. You know, and, and, and it'll depend. You know, if your computer crashes, you'll be screwed. You know, that kind of thing. But if you had, you know, in the best possible world, you'd have a massive data information program. You know, someone like Jean-Luc with the T3 database. And we'll have it already rocking and rolling. Okay? Okay, let's take one from, did I answer your question? Let's take another one from the distance group. I want to make sure they feel good. Okay, that's, that's a little bit beyond what I normally talk about, but what the heck, I can give you an answer. Question is, uh, we're preserving our germplasm in artificial conditions. How do we uh, keep enough germplasm to work for future climate change is what he's really asking. The answer I would say is this. We're, our collections have all the... Look at, look at a, uh, a variety as a novel or as a, a, a piece of literature. If in your collection you have all the words, you can write any novel, right? Now, most of us are writing not too well. Not many of us are Shakespeare's, right? Or things like that. So I'm not worried about that, that we're losing our genetic resources in the wild as much as I would be if we were losing all of our genes. Now, fortunately, we're not doing either. I mean, if you've ever been to in situ collections, that germplasm is still there to be sampled. And we have to make sure we have in situ. That means in the wild collections. But in wheat, we have 100,000 accessions. We have most of the spoken language in the genes. And now with genome-wide selection, I can find, hopefully, the combinations that make that novel. Okay, That's what I'm looking for. If I've got the words, breeders write the novel. If I don't have the words, then I'm screwed. And, and I do get worried about some parts of climate change, but that's, we can discuss that at another time. Now, there was a question over here. Okay, I, 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 di I didn't hear your, you, there's, uh, there's more, oh, the epigenome. Okay, the question is, um, the question I gave was the, the phenotype equals the genotype plus the environment plus the genotype by environment interaction. We added management. Should we also add that the genotype includes the epigenome? And the answer would be absolutely. I mean, now how we get there, we're not entirely sure because my, my expectation is the epigenome will be sort of an epistasis and so that you or a pleiotropism where you may have one gene in your background that interacts with others that leads to epigenomic changes. And so the question would be, if the epigenome is predictable, we can use it. If it's not, well, then we're back to like the weather. You know, we've, we've partitioned what we can. So you'd end up changing that to the genotype on it. Now, I think that's time for break, right? Yes. With that, we're going to Okay. And now we've got a break scheduled. We come back uh, in about 15 minutes at 1040 for Dr. Jody Edwards' presentation. So we'll see you back in a little bit.